You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Matt Migaki, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while sharing killer craft beers. If you've ever wanted to sneak backstage and share a beer with one of your favorite musicians, well, Vox and Hops is the podcast for you. This week on the podcast, I dropped a killer episode with Kelly Schaefer of Atheist. There is this episode and over 440 other ones to help you enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. So what are you waiting for? It's time to become a Vox and Hops head. Cheers. Hey, 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 what's going on, everybody? I hope everybody's fine and everybody's glorious and all that stuff. This episode is coming out on Memorial Day here in the States, and so a lot of you might be traveling or something, and if you are, please stay safe. You know, all that stuff. Be careful out there. I want everybody in one piece, because there's more podcasts to listen to, for crying out loud. Anyway, uh, everyone, I hope you're having a happy holiday, and I hope everything is good. Before we get into today's episode, I want to tell you about a couple things. One of them being Sinusoid. Yes, the Soid boys. They're still around, they're still with us, and man, I could not be happier about it. Great guys making great products up in Washington, and what do they make, you might ask? You might be a first-time listener. You never heard of this Sinusoid before. They make the world's best instrument cables. They offer a variety of different brands and different connectors, different colors, different colors of TechFlex, all the things you could possibly tweak on a cable. They have it as an option on their website. You can go to their custom cable builder and build exactly what you need. If you're listening to this, you're probably a musician. You've probably plugged into a thing a time or two. Maybe even an electric guitar. Who knows? Who knows? But Sinusoid is where you go when you need the best cables made by the best people. And did I mention... They come with a 100-year warranty. Yeah, 100 years. So unless you are a cyborg or um, a zombie, uh, maybe a a Greek mythological creature, you're going to be okay. For most of us, 100 years is plenty of warranty, and I like not having to worry about things. And the Sinusoid crew will take care of you should anything go awry. But go to Sinusoid.com, check them out today, show them some love, tell them that I sent you, and all that jazz. And I, I haven't mentioned this in a while, but in the show notes for every episode here, in case you like can't really like don't want to like type things, which who does? Typing's typing's lame. You can just hit the link. So we got all the sponsors for each episode is listed in the description of the show notes, and that should pop up in whatever podcast player you're using. Let me know if it's not, but it's definitely there on the Tone Mob website. So you can just click links and it'll take you right to where you need to go for all of these sponsors, including Gun Street Wiring Shop. Gun Street Wiring Shop out of Bend, Oregon. So if you're going to be upgrading any of the wiring in any of your guitars, this is the place you go. They make it easy, the customer service is top-notch, and Sean can build just about anything that you can think of. So if you've got a crazy wiring idea, this is the place you go. Go to GunStreetWiringShop.com. You can browse whatever they have available. They've got 50s wiring, modern wiring, uh, treble bleed circuits, all that kind of traditional stuff. But they also... Do things that are crazy, way outside the box, way, way outside the box. Gun Street is where you go for that kind of stuff, and it is all premium quality, made by real human beings who really care, and let me tell you, Sean's just one of the best guys, so you're supporting good people too when you go to Gun Street, so go to GunStreetWiringShop.com and upgrade your axe today. That sounded really weird. That was creepy. I won't do that again. Yeah, I might. I, I might. Anyways, enough of that. We are also brought to you by the Stringjoy Pension Calculator. What? Pension Calculator? Oh, yeah. Yeah, see, their thing over there is doing... They started doing custom strings. That was like their bread and butter when they first started. They still do it. It's still a big part of their their business. And to make it easier for you to figure out what gauge of strings you need for your application, they actually spent their their hard-earned dollars to develop their own string tension calculator. Because the other ones that are available online, they're floating around out there in the interwebs somewhere. They're not exactly, they're not exactly right, and they're definitely not exactly correct for string joy strings. Anyways, that's enough of that. We are also brought to you by the String Joy String Tension Calculator. Oh, yes. String Joy actually went out of their way to make their own string tension calculator, 
because the others that have been available online for several years, they didn't exactly translate into their strings. So you would type things into this calculator and then you would send Scott an email saying, hey, this calculator told me I need these strings to get this much tension and blah, 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 blah. Basically, it wasn't right. They needed their own calculator for their own strings so that it could be accurate because they're constructed differently. So there's a little more mass to them than some other strings. The core to cover ratios are a little different. And so the string itself is just a little bit different. And the same gauge is not necessarily going to have the same tension brand to brand. So they made their own. And you can go on there and whip up a custom set and you'll know exactly what you need to order. You can click over and grab it all and have the set of your dreams. I know, you've been dreaming about strings, right? That's, that's normal. Everyone does that. I don't know. But there will be a link in the show notes to the String Joy String Tension Calculator. And you can go play around with the numbers on that. It's a lot of fun. You can kind of get wild and just see what different things do in different tunings on different scale lengths and blah, 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 blah. It's a good time. So check it out. String Joy String Tension Calculator. And finally, I want to tell you about Reverb. Reverb, as many of you are aware, is the place where you can go buy basically any kind of gear you can think of. You go to Reverb.com, you're going to type in some random search for some weird esoteric pedal that no one's ever heard of, but hey, it's probably on Reverb, because they got it all. And if you want to support the show, an easy way for you to do that is just to go to ToneMob.com slash Reverb for all of your Reverb needs. So whether you're buying, selling, whatever you're doing, if, you're, if you've never heard of Reverb before somehow, and you just go set up an account, anything you do through ToneMob.com slash Reverb comes back and helps support the show, keeps the lights on, pays the servers, blah, 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 blah. Because as it turns out, while they're free to listen to, podcasts are not free to create or to post. And so we need lights and microphones and, I don't know, I need a bowl of M&Ms with all the green ones removed because that's just how it is. I mean, just is what it is. No, but seriously, if you go to tonemob.com slash reverb, you can do all of your reverb so- shop, yeah, shop. Wow, my voice isn't working. All your reverb shopping, anything you do through that link will help come back and support the show. It doesn't cost you anything extra. Your experience should not be any different. It would be the reverb.com you know and love, but just make sure you use the link tonemob.com slash reverb for everything. And... I'll be a happy camper, and everyone will be happy. Everyone, the whole world. Sure, whatever, Blake. All right, that's it for the housekeeping and whatnot for this week. I'm going to get right into this episode with Drew Swindle from Swindler Effects. Boom, here you go. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Tone Mob podcast, the show about guitar tone and the people behind it. I'm your host, Blake Wyland, and with me today, I have Drew Swindle of Swindler Effects. How's it going, man? It's going good. Pretty good. You were just telling me that you're about to break record highs for Alabama, of all places, this weekend. Is that, that like, like how high, how hot are we talking about here? We're talking about 96, 97, I think 95 today. Ooh. It's up there, man. And humid, right? Yeah, it is real sticky, real humid, (laughs) real hot. You feel it. Have you always lived there? Uh, Yeah, I have my whole life, at least in the Birmingham area. Except for uh, I went to college in Tuscaloosa, which is about 45, about 45 minutes to an hour. But uh, yeah. Been here my whole life. As soon as you said that, all I could think of was this Towns Van Zant song, song where he talks about a Tuscaloosa bar. And it was like, <laughs> it's the only other time I've li- I've ever heard that term or that the name of that town used in a sentence. And so as soon as you said that, it was transported to some dive bar in the deep south. <laughs> nice. Yeah, there's a couple of them. For sure. So wh- why don't you why don't you tell us your backstory? Like, what got you into effects? Like, where did you start? What's what's square one? Uh, square one. Let's see. My story is pretty similar to a lot of people's, I'm sure. But uh, I started playing guitar when I was like 12, and it was kind of in bands and different groups here and there. 
and uh, was really active in my like church worship group and stuff like that. Um, so I was playing with some people in college, um, was getting ready to graduate, it was about my senior year of a, a college at Alabama, and uh, had some guys who were looking for some like just some simple pedals like tap tempos and like a B switchers and like a boost pedal, like just some really simple stuff. And, uh, I was in college for electrical engineering, computer engineering, particularly. And, uh, I got to thinking, I, I had never really put two and two together, but I was like, I should, I should probably know like how to do some of this stuff. Like with what I'm learning in my, my education, I should be able to figure something like that out. And that could be a lot of fun. Um, right. So I, I started, uh, I think the very first pedal I built was a favorite switch for my Strymon El Capistan. That was the first thing I ever made, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and then I did some, did those, those AB switchers and some kind of simple stuff for my, my bandmates. And then uh, I like to say that the black hole just opens up and sucks you in. You know, you just get, you get addicted to figuring out what you can do and what's possible and I just would spend hours and days and weeks just reading forums and researching and looking up circuits and all kinds of stuff. And I just sucks you in deep. So, and uh, here I am all that time later. But uh, after that, uh, I graduated college. I started doing custom shop stuff for a while. Um, just kind of a little bit of everything. Uh I took just a lot of custom shop requests just to kind of learn as much as I could. Um, did that for, let's see, about three years probably. Um, but anyone who like does custom shop knows that that's like, a, it can be a long, tedious process. Um, a lot of back and forth, a lot of trying to figure out what the customer wants and researching a lot if you, if it's something you're not familiar with. So in about 20, Early 2015, I decided I kind of wanted to do something that was more like personalized. It was more like our brand because before it was just, you know, whatever anyone wanted. I was just kind of doing what everyone, anyone asked me to do. And that was a lot of fun. But I wanted something that was kind of more of our stuff, more of our brand. So 2015, I, you know, I released our first three pedals and then I kind of have released another one couple months after that ever since so it's been great uh yeah that's kind of i guess the backstory if you want you you have kind of an interesting arc to the uh i don't know what you what you would want to call it but almost like the life of the brand has been kind of interesting at least from my perspective because initially when you launched in 2015 i think you i think you launched around the same time i did to be perfectly honest like right in the same ballpark and uh, yeah. at least the same, at least the same year, um, for sure. And and you had a totally different look, which actually was a great look. It was it was really appealing. But then you started coming out with these minimalist designs, and it it feels like I remember like I shared a couple of them because I just thought they were so cool looking, and people really seemed to like latch onto that minimalist look that you guys uh, had for some mm -hmm. short runs or something, and that eventually transformed yeah. the whole thing. Right? Is that is that accurate? It did that you're exactly correct. Um, so yeah, when we first started, we had, so all of our pedals are named, the names of all of them are kind of Birmingham based, or we've now kind of expanded to more Alabama based names. So like the iron drive and the, the magic city and all that kind of stuff. And Birmingham being kind of an industrial, it's like the Pittsburgh of the South with steel and iron and, and manufacturing and stuff. So, all that was kind of where all the names came from. And our, our graphics originally were kind of kind of cartoony in a way, representations of the names themselves. Um, right. And they kind of drove that idea home, um, particularly like our Red Mountain, like Red Mountain, Tremolo. Red Mountain is a park here in Birmingham. It's a really popular um, park. And, uh, so that had a red mountain on it and just made perfect sense. Um, but so I don't remember when it was. Um, it was before the red mountain was released, but we had a, we had a guy, a graphic designer out of New York actually came up with the idea. It was totally random. Um, uh, 
and we, we referenced him on our website, Matt Krause, um, out of New York. He, he came to us and he wanted our magic city delay. And, um, he's like, I want your delay, but I want this, this particular graphic on it. And he sent it to us and he told us kind of the reasoning behind it and where he came up with it. And I was like, yeah, that's really cool. We were still young enough. I think we only had the first three, maybe four pedals out at the time. So we were still super small and we still are honestly, but we were like, yeah, we can do that. We can accommodate that. No problem. So we did it and we posted it on Instagram, just a picture of it. And at the time that thing blew up, we had more interest and likes and comments and just engagement on that Instagram post than like we ever have. And we were like, wow, this, like people love this. This is crazy. And, mm-hmm. uh, he saw, he saw the same thing. He, he saw all the interest in that post and he was like, Hey, you know, I do this for a living, but, uh, guitar is my hobby as well. I'd love to help you guys out. If, if you want, I would do this kind of graphic for all of your pedals if you want. And we could, you know, offer it as a different, different type and different line. And I was like, yeah, why not? That sounds like a great idea. Yeah, people seem to love it. So we, we went for a couple years maybe maybe one or two years where we were offering both we were offering the old what we called the signature design series and the minimalist what we call the functionalist design series mm-hmm. and um that was good for a while but it, it kind of started to get complicated particularly with dealers because dealers didn't know like which one they should buy like with individuals ordering from us it didn't it didn't matter because they just picked whichever one they liked but dealers kind of right. got confused not not knowing which one they should carry. And I felt kind of bad about that. And I, I wasn't sure what to do. And as time went on, the functionalist design really seemed to catch on more. It really picked up better. And we just weren't selling as many of the signature. I still love the signature just because of their history and what they mean, what they represent with the, the pedals themselves. But we decided in the end that it was better to just kind of standardize on the functionalist design. And, uh, that's been super great for brand recognition, especially because it's very, it's very minimalist, but bold and it's very recognizable. So like I can see a pedal board from a long way off or a picture that's not great and pretty much immediately tell if our pedal is on it or not. And that's been super cool um, just to be able to pick things out really easily. And the recognition has been great. We've rebranded everything, you know, packaging stickers website you know everything you could think of has been kind of rebranded under this functionalist minimalist design look and uh i really dig it um and it seems to be seems to be what what the majority of people enjoy as well so it's been great it's really hard when you're you're so close to something in the creative process whether that's a song or you know a piece of art or you know pedals or anything that you're creating some hard, sometimes it's hard to see what others see and or hear mm-hmm. and and so when i i remember that like that moment very clearly like scrolling through and like whoa what is that like and it's just i don't know what it is about that functionalist design but it's it's very it, like you said there's not there's not much to it but it's very pronounced in the right ways and i i yeah. still i still think it's one of the most attractive uh brandings of any pedal company that that's out there right now it just looks Thanks. it just looks awesome it just looks so good i'm i'm actually i'm super attracted to it as well because of kind of where it came from when when Krauss told us the background behind it the functionalist design is a is a school it's a theory of design it was developed by a guy named dieter rams um and he did a lot of work um for like brawn like the brawn old radios and stuff so like his whole design about, yeah yeah, you know what I'm saying? So his whole design theory was minimalist and out of the way, but descriptive and informative. So it's like portraying as much information as you can, but as as in the background as you can be without being distracting. So like not taking away from the product itself, but fully explaining it in a in a simplistic way. So when he kind of explained where all that was coming from, that 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 really hit home. I, I really latched onto that and enjoyed it myself. So I was all on board. There's some other changes too, right? Like you did some major revisions or something recently. Yeah, yeah. So 
Oh, that was a, pretty... that was a, like a sigh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, it's a sigh of relief at this point, or we're almost there. So last year, um, I would have been 28, tw- pretty much all of 2018. We pretty much disappeared. We kind of just took, took 2018 off. Like everything was out of stock on our website. I didn't contact dealers. I didn't do really anything. I kind of purposely made us disappear. Cause, and the big, the big catalyst for that was at the end of 2017, we released our Gulf Chorus. And that thing is great and it's a fantastic pedal, but it's, it was super difficult to make. Um, there's just a ton of components. It took forever to make. And uh, I really kind of under, underestimated the, the demand for that, I guess. Um, so we just couldn't keep up. And it was just, it was starting to get kind of miserable trying to build those things the way we were doing it. Um, so we kind of fulfilled all of our outstanding orders on that. And I was like, we've, we've got to fix this. Because I, I do pedals part-time. Um, I've, I've got a full-time engineering job, eight to five. Um, so I just couldn't, I just didn't have the time to devote to all this um at the time so i decided once we fulfilled those orders starting kind of at the beginning of 2018 we disappeared and revamped our entire manufacturing thinking of efficiency reliability scalability consistency hitting on all those big points trying to make as good a product make our product as solid and stable as we possibly could and efficient in the manufacturing. So we converted all of our designs over to majority SMD components, surface mount components, um, which took was a big learning curve. It's a, it's a totally different way to build things. So I had to kind of teach myself what the differences were about those components and pick components in a way that the sound wasn't affected, but they were built a lot better and a lot, lot quicker. Um, so that's just a long process. And at the same time, doing that conversion of our circuits, not only am am, am I redesigning the circuits, but I'm also working with outsourcing them to like, uh, a dedicated manufacturer, uh, a fab house. So I'm working with figuring out what their specifications are and trying to figure out how to best suit our designs to fit their, their production style so that they can build them as quickly and as efficiently and as uh, error-free as possible. So a lot of back and forth with that, figuring out what their requirements are and all that. So the first, the first, uh, I started that conversion with our simpler designs, with like our first three or four pedals. Really, we we released, you know, the compressor, the overdrive, the delay, the reverb. Those are kind of the simpler stuff. So started with those, made sure those were all good, and I kind of understood what all the requirements were. And then I went and converted our more complex designs, the Red Mountain Tremolo and the uh, the Gulf Chorus. And in the process of doing those upgrades, I went ahead and packed quite a few more features into those because the surface mount offered me more space to do that. And I was able to kind of explore some options that I always wish I could have included, but just wasn't possible with the way things were being built before. So super excited about that. I, um, we're talking here on Memorial Day weekend. uh, Yeah. Can you share what those extra features are? Is that under the the curtain? No, it's, uh, I've actually, as of the last couple of weeks, I've been kind of posting what those updates have been on Instagram. And, uh, Uh so they're no, they're not any secret anymore, but talking, you know, here on Memorial Day weekend, 2019 the gulf i just actually released the gulf for public sale again last night um so it's finally like you know ready for people to buy it again but the the gulf course and the red mountain tremolo both have a very similar control structure um the 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 circuits themselves the effect circuits themselves are purely analog so they your guitar signal is fully analog but the digital control side of things is where I tend to specialize. And uh, so that's what got a lot of the, the revamping. So for like the red mount, for both of them, all of the knobs, all of the parameters, all the controls are now fully digitally controlled. 
So before there were a couple of knobs that were purely analog controlled. And what that means is because they're digitally controlled now, they're savable in presets um, and, mm -hmm. and other things. So like we've uh, also we've added MIDI and that was a big thing that we did um, that what didn't exist before. We added MIDI functionality to both of those pedals. And because all the print, all the controls are digitally controlled now, that means they are also controllable through MIDI. So it's, it's a huge, huge update that offers just a, a massive um, feature set expansion for depending on people, how, how people want to control those pedals. Um, so we also, uh, let's, let me see. We expanded on some of our speed tempo ramping um, functions, some different modes of how the, the tempo ramping works. Um, for the tremolo, a big update was we actually added a harmonic mode. Um, no. Previously, we just had a, it was just a, it's a stereo tremolo. So previously we just had standard stereo trim and then kind of like a ping pong out of phase mode where it would pan between the two outputs. But in the in the upgrade, I added a harmonic mode on top of that. So that was a huge area that I wish I could have gotten before. But with this update, it allowed me to uh, squeeze that guy in. Um, That's almost like adding a whole a whole another pedal into it. That's fantastic. Yeah, for sure. And it it's a it's a it actually ch changed the circuit. The circuit's pretty different because of the harmonic mode, but it all it all works the same way if that makes sense so it, yeah, uh, it does it it sounds just as good as it, as it did before but done in a totally different way so to to offer to be able to offer that harmonic mode but uh well with the midi and the digitally control the expanded digital control we've expanded the presets as well so both those pedals had an onboard preset and that still exists, but with MIDI, we've also expanded. Um, I think we're doing we're doing fifty, so it's probably overkill. But you have each pedal has fifty presets you can access through MIDI now. So, wow, that's <laughs> that's quite a that is quite a jump. So I think I think that'll that'll be really cool for people to be able to experience all that. And and what you've managed to do also is keep them small. They're not very big. Yes. They're regular size pedals. Was that a major mm -hmm. challenge? Yeah, that's that was always the goal, and that's what made it kind of uh, that's what made it more difficult. Because I could always, I could, you know, I could have way back in the day, I could have added all these features that I wanted to add if I just doubled the size of the enclosure. You know, like mm -hmm. that would have been no problem. But at the same time, that's also not really a challenge <laughs> and and I like to I like to try and challenge myself and and do stuff that maybe is not as common so and me just as a personal player I didn't want them to be any bigger than what they were so uh for my personal board um I just like to keep things as compact as they feasibly can be I don't like mini pedals necessarily but um so yeah those like the Gulf and the Red Mountain are actually, there's actually two circuits in each of those that are stacked on top of each other. Um, there's there's the lower circuit that's your like analog effect, and then the the elevated circuit that attaches on top of that is all the digital control platform. So that uh, took a long time to design correctly and to get everything to uh, to line up and fit just right. I mean, I've got. I've got some parts that are kind of very particularly chosen so that everything fits just <laughs> just how it needs to. So it took some time, but it was it was worth it to not make it larger. Um, Cause yeah, to keep those I mean, if you look at those pedals, both of them are stereo as well. So I'm I mean, you go try and look on the internet and find a stereo tap tempo tremolo or chorus in that size enclosure with expression and tap tempo and midi i mean your options are very minimal especially at the price point that we're hitting you know so that was kind of the the goal was to 
do every single feature that the major that your average musician would ever want on those effects, but keep it in a you know a manageable size. So, and at a, a price point that is you know more approachable. So your background, you said it was in electronic engineering and computer engineering. Yeah, yeah. I'm imagining that can't help but inform your design process. Do you find that yours is different than other builders or, or what do you see there? Um, so it, it's kind of strange because I don't feel like my education really helped so much in what you consider like the analog guitar circuit side of things. Cause you know, I can, with my education, I, you know, I learned about op amps and transistors and analyzing circuits and stuff, but how that translates into audible sounds is total, like teach yourself and just learn as you go and trial and error. So when it comes really? to like, yeah. So when it comes to, I mean, other people, who are more educated than I am probably would disagree in some, some aspect, but when it comes to developing like the analog circuitry part, it's a lot of like breadboarding old popular circuits and tweaking it and changing it and figuring out different additions and subtractions I can do to get the sound that I'm looking for. And it's a lot of just literal breadboarding and, um, uh, I'm a little more efficient at that probably than, than your average tinkerer. But um, I think where my background really comes into play is the digital side of things. So because I focused on computer engineering, I traded a lot of my electrical engineering classes for programming classes. Um, so that's where I've really tried to kind of carve out our niche, if you will. So like that makes us a little more separated than the, you know, the guy who just taught himself. Um, Cause it's a lot harder to, teach yourself programming that whole side of things than it is to just kind of, you know, tweak a fuzz circuit, you know? So, uh, that's where my education has really given me a kind of an advantage, I think, because I'm able to add that digital control side of things and open up the possibilities of expand the usability of these popular great sounding circuits because I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you that I'm not necessarily the most creative in like new and innovative sounds for the guitar. I'm at this point, I'm, I'm more interested and more um, equipped to expand those sounds and make those sounds more usable in a bunch of different contexts. And, uh, expanding the feature sets on those great sounding effects if that makes sense it does um, it does it's a little more practical and a little less old blood like yeah if that makes any sense old yeah blood noise so like is who I'm, I'm referring to for people yeah, who didn't yeah. know what i was talking about so i'm looking at like looking at the stuff that like maris i think we talked to you know you mentioned or no i was talking to someone else we were talking about maris and they're just doing crazy stuff you know, and it's oh, yeah. phenomenal and it's amazing, but it's just like, that's not necessarily where my mind goes. Like if I were to buy a product like that, I don't personally know how I would even use it. You know what I mean? I'm a simple guy as far as the sounds that I, I'm kind of, I hear in my head and that I go after. So I like to start with kind of your staple, great sounding effects and get as much out of them as I can is, is kind of my design philosophy at least at this time um so yeah who who inspires you sonically either as a player or an engineer so i've always let's see i've definitely looked up to people like joel chase bliss um his our our kind of the way that we approach pedals i think is very similar and in, in how he keeps everything or how he he keeps his his analog heart digital brain you know that whole motto is something that i really appreciate um and just getting as much out of out of a pedal as you can um so that's I really look up to to those guys 
Um, I'm trying to think of people like Empress. Um, Empress is doing some crazy stuff. Oh man, that Zoya is just out of that, control. That's, a, that's another one I was thinking of. Like, it's amazing what they've been able to do with that. But that's another one of those things that I have no idea what that thing really even is. <laughs> to be perfectly <laughs> honest, so it's it's a machine it's, uh, that you you jack into and then you don't come out for about four yep. years, and then you come out and the world's different. That's basically what it is. Yep. As far as it's I can crazy. Tell. So, what kind of music do you listen to? Ah, uh, let's see. Uh, it really depends on my mood for sure, but I'm definitely more on the like kind of alt rock, emo indie, math rock. Uh, I enjoy some some of the harder sides of of the emo math rock stuff. I guess you could say um, that's probably what I gravitate towards most. Like, who are your, some of your favorite bands? Let's see. I could look at what I've just been listening to recently here. Listen to a lot of like uh, people like uh, Tiny Moving Parts, Foxing. Really enjoy Foxing. Um, been doing, been listening to a lot of like Me Without You lately. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw As Cities Burn in concert not long ago. So I've actually oh, I forgot them. about that band. They're a good band. They're back. They're actually coming back. They're going on tour. They got a new CD coming out. Cool. Uh, and then people like Chon. I enjoy instrumental stuff too. Like I saw Caspian not long ago, and that was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Uh, Covet, you know, that kind of realm of things, I guess you could say. Yeah, I feel you. That's definitely a pedal heavy uh, genre, generally. I guess I yeah. know if that's that's not all the same genre, but I get what you're saying. Yeah, for sure. Have you had any instances where you, you know you've gotten like like oh that guy wants to buy a pedal from me? Like I listened to his band, or you know just weird things or cool things that have happened to you as a result of starting the company? Uh, I'm trying to remember. Not a ton. Uh, and that's something we're actually trying to get better at. And it, it, it's difficult because especially the way our company used to be, you know, like I said, I do it full, part-time and I have a full-time job. So that I think we're going to be able to kind of reach out and try to network a little more going forward because our manufacturing has become so much more efficient and it kind of opens up the time. All my time before that was just dedicated to literally building. So didn't really offer up those networking opportunities, but it's, we've had a couple of cool instances. Like I've, um, I don't know if any of them actively use any of our products. We like, I hooked up with, um, the guys from colony house at one point. Um, I hooked up with, uh, the mute math guys when they came through Birmingham and, uh, oh, nice. I know Todd, Todd, um, from, or used to be with Mute Math, has a couple of our pedals, and he uses them in his his home studio on session stuff sometimes. And that's really cool. I found out about that actually not not too long ago, um, that he was actually enjoying some of them and using them. And that was actually a really cool moment. Um, so I've loved Mute Math for ever, absolutely forever. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, but not too many. I had a couple of couple of guys who've tried stuff out in the praise and worship world. Um, but I can't actually say how much they got used. Um, right. That makes sense. No, um, I get it. Yeah. I just know they've played with them before. So when you're, when you're just kind of, you know, head down, breadboarding away has has there any been any has, uh, excuse me have there been any like aha moments while doing that like oh this was so confusing to me for so long but now i understand hmm that's a good question um 
I feel like I get a lot more aha moments when I'm dealing with uh, programming, doing the coding, and with like circuit board layout, actually. So um, I'm still, I've still got a lot to learn on the analog circuitry and breadboarding is, is breadboarding. It's kind of like you, you try stuff and it either works or it doesn't sounds good or it doesn't. That's kind of how I, I feel about that. Um, but like just recently I got the, um, what I hope to be the final prototype of our looper, our, our Nexus four looper. And, uh, oh. the way I, the way I redesigned that circuit, the way I converted that over to surface mount and the way everything fits when I got that and dropped that in the enclosure, that was like a, Ooh, yes. That is amazing. I was so excited. You know, I'd go show my wife and she's like, okay, that's cool. And I was like, <laughs> Damn, you don't understand. So that's, you that's just have to text me with these things. I found that out. I, I found that a long time ago. I'm like, look, look, honey, this is amazing. And she's like, sure is. Have fun, dear. I'm like, oh, yeah. OK, I'll go back in my hole. Like, <laughs> this is where I belong. This yeah. box of when shame. A, when a uh, when a circuit layout just fits just right in an enclosure and it is just it's just is perfect, just drops right in and everything fits just perfectly. Or you, you finally figure out this this code or you fig you fix this code bug that you've been dealing with. I get those moments, you know, every now and then I just I run up I run up to her and I'm like, I'm a genius. Yes. And she's like, <laughs> Okay, that's great. <laughs> so she's like, Yeah, are, yeah, yeah, that's are, great. Please take out the trash. Yep. Yep. That's mm -hmm. uh that's where my uh that's where all my aha moments tend to come or at least that I get most excited about. It's just, yes, it's, it's, I got it. It's perfect. Um, so here's, here's something that I selfishly would like to dive into. It's a little bit, it's, it's entirely self-serving because I am a MIDI, like I'm very interested in it and I understand the concept behind it, but like, integrating it into a rig is something that I am very hesitant to do. It looks, it looks very intimidating. Can you offer any advice in that department? But I was talking to, who was I? I was talking to someone else about this. MIDI is, it's complex on the surface, but if you actually look into it compared to some other things or some other like, uh, control schemes that you, I, I don't know for lack of a better word it's actually about as simple as you can get for like a digital control scheme um so my advice is honestly just to like get a simple controller and then just try stuff um because it's really just the experimenting and the and the just trying to make it do something that you learn the most about it and really like i'm not an expert by any means but the two big parts of midi in my that i consider is like your cc control change messages and your pc program change messages and in simple terms program change messages are just a way to access usually presets in digital pedals and then cc messages in a simple way is just to control particular parameters of a pedal so like on our on our pedals the red mountain and the gulf you can control any of the knobs and any of the toggle switches and any of the foot switches through different cc messages and depending on what value you send with that message tells the where the knob is set or if the switch is pressed or if the switch isn't pressed or where the toggle switch is is located um, and then your PC program change messages are what you would send the pedal to activate um, different presets. So like you, if you want to activate preset two, you would send it program change message two and it would, it would recall that preset. Um, so that's, that's about as, as deep as I've gotten into MIDI um, and MIDI programming. There's a lot of other things you can do, but I, I'm 
I just kind of scratched the surface to be honest with what I use and what I offer. Um, but those are the, those are the big parts. Um, people are, people are scared because sometimes it depends on what you look at. Cause like there are some manuals, like if you look at some gear product manuals, they'll have like all these crazy tables and like some of them even, I, I can't remember which ones, but I've seen them like dive into like the actual like MIDI byte message that it sends and like all the bits and all that. And that's some of the means. first stuff I, I ever saw. And I was like, Whoa, I don't know about this. Yeah. I'm just a guitarist so that here. Gets, that gets really overwhelming when it's like trying to explain that like the first two bytes mean this and the first, t- the next three bits mean this, that honestly, you don't need to know that. It might be nice to know it. I don't know. But I've never needed to know that when I've just been playing and like utilizing it. Really, you just need to know that you're sending and receiving on the correct MIDI channel and look at the product manual of what you're trying to control so that you know what the values need to be for whatever you're trying to control. Like if you're trying to control the speed knob on something, you need to know that the speed knob is CC number 10 or whatever, so that you know to control number 10. It's really, if you just, honestly, if anyone just kind of gets in and like messes with it and, and figures out what they're doing wrong, it's a, uh, it's actually pretty quick to pick up on. And especially if you have stuff that's like, if you have a lot of digitally controlled pedals and you have like a nice, like true bypass looper and you can just like, with one button totally just like step through your your set it's 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 wild yeah it's it's interesting i was really hot on the boss es8 train when it first came out i was like oh i'm totally getting one of those look at all this stuff it can do uh and then my friend leon from pelican noiseworks got one and he brought it to a practice and started doing all this crazy stuff with it and i was like oh maybe i don't want one of those and now lately <laughs> I've been talking to guys like you and it's like, maybe I do want one. Maybe I just need to try it. Maybe I just need to dive in and, and see. And now you're making me feel even more that way. It's just time to just to rip the bandaid off. There's no reason yeah. that I shouldn't know more than I know about that particular subject in pedals. Uh, yeah. It's, I mean, it's actually kind of silly. Yeah. I mean, you're not, it's worth trying. I mean, you, it's, uh, it's definitely overwhelming if you don't have a goal in mind is, is how I'd see it. So like um, if you bought like an ES8, you know, those can do so much and it can be overwhelming if you're just looking at it. But if you approach it from an aspect of like, I want it to do this and you try and figure out how to get it to do that, then that's kind of taking those short little stepping stones to get where you want to go. You know, it's, it's like, you know, doing anything, you just kind of have to get started. Like if you get started and just kind of bite off little chunks, then it'll make sense as you go. But it's the getting started. That's always the hardest part. Cause it's just like, man, I don't even know, I don't even know how to approach this, but cause I, I first got into my first run in with MIDI was I wanted a better way to, I use MIDI with my Strymon timeline. Uh So you hear about all these people who get a timeline and then they sell it because they can't access all the presets or they don't utilize it enough. They, cause like, to be honest, like the two button banking system is kind of cumbersome, especially depending on where it is on your pedal board. And I was like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to be, I don't be, I don't want to be one of those guys. I want to actually try and get the most out of it. So I got, I've got a little MIDI controller that I use. And the first thing I ever tried to do was just access different presets with the controller so that I could get to them easily and not have to do that two button banking. And that's like a simple jump in point, but like kind of learning how to make that work allows you to understand kind of the basis of how MIDI as a whole works. And then it allows you to really kind of dive deeper 
So start simple, start with a goal and just dive into it and just, just, yeah. just do it. All right. Yeah. I'm going to do it. Just try and make, just make some, make some presets on a digital pedal and then try and get a MIDI controller to access those presets for you. That's what I would say. That's a good idea. I, mean, that's a, I shouldn't. That's that's just a great like universal goal that would be nice to have. You know, I'm sure you would you would benefit from knowing that or being able to do that. Yes, I definitely would, and I have a ton of pedals that have all kinds of functionality that I have not explored due to my my hesitate my MIDI hesitation. So mm-hmm. I you know I uh, I should like I said I should know a lot more about it, and and the way you explained it makes a lot of sense because. My dad comes over and he looks at my pedals and he's like, I don't have a clue where to begin with these. And to me, it's like, well, just turn the knobs and figure out what you like. Uh, But he's, you know, primarily an acoustic player. I don't know if he's ever purposely plugged in a guitar pedal before. Uh, And so it's just not in his wheelhouse. To me, it's like, oh, it's easy. It's an overdrive. You just you just plug it in and these knobs do that. But when I first ever held a TS9 in my hand, I didn't know what it was really. I was like, yeah. what's this green thing that, that I heard Stevie Ray Vaughan uses? Like, I don't know what this is. I had, I didn't know yeah. what it was. I didn't know how to properly, you know, quote unquote, properly use one or how most people use them. I didn't know anything. And I'm kind of, I'm not quite that, that noob with the, with MIDI stuff, but I can under, I, I feel exactly the same as I felt when I first get discovered the world of pedals, like, Oh, there's so much to learn. How could I ever know it? Now it's like, ah, pedals. I, this is my thing is, is pedals. Uh, <laughs> so I should, I should take a similar approach because that's what I did with pedals. I just dove in. I wanted to know. So I dove in. Time to yeah, stop being a just, baby. Yeah. Just dive in and, uh, don't try and bite it up, you know, take it all in one bite. You know, yeah, there's thousands and thousands of pedals out there, but, do you need an envelope filter for what you're trying to do? Or do you need an overdrive? If you need an overdrive, then focus on that. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. MIDI is the same way. You know, MIDI can do so many things, but what do you need it to do? If you need it to do a very small subset, you know, focus on that and figure it out. And then it, the rest will come easier. So, yeah. I feel like that's good advice just for life. Just yeah. in general. Just whatever you're trying to do. If it seems big and daunting... Just just hack away a little bit at a time. And there you go. Like like you just said, what do you need it to do? What do you want out of it? You don't necessarily like I don't need to know about the bits and bytes. I'm not going to study that. I do not need to know that. I'm not even going to try. But yeah, to get it to get access to some presets would be would be nice. I feel like that's within my mental capacity. There you go. I believe in you. I know you can do it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad somebody <laughs> believed in me. <laughs> The world isn't the way that my third grade teacher told me it was, and I'm very depressed about it. Not everybody, not everybody can just dream big and do it. I don't, I don't, I feel like I've been lied to. Yeah. Takes a lot of hard work. <laughs> <laughs> so here's yeah, a yeah. question for you. You kind of, you kind of t- talked about it earlier with the Chase Bliss stuff, but are there any particular products out there that you are kind of jealous of or wish you had thought of or maybe just your favorite your favorite pedal that you don't make hmm that's a good question so i will actually say i'm i'm considering i've been looking at stuff it's actually on the the midi side again but uh because i'm trying to figure out exactly what I want to do with this this Nexus upgrade. And I've been really jealous of the Morningstar products. Are you familiar with mm-hmm. those? Yes, I am. So their, their MIDI controller for its size and its functionality and it, the way you can fi- configure it seems amazing. They've got a, a web editor that you can directly choose what each foot switch does and different type different ways that you press the foot switch can send different messages and the way all that is user configured is brilliant and i gotta figure out some way to do that with our nexus because it needs it (laughs) so uh i've I've been really jealous over that guy figuring out how they did that and trying to implement something similar um a long time ago i actually 
was trying to tinker with like tap tempo controllers, like like the uh, Disaster Area Smart Clock and the Court, the Sela Courts. I had kind of uh-huh. tinkered around with doing stuff like that a long time ago, but then like the newest courts came out, and I just bought one of those because I was like, "Dang, they just they killed it!" <laughs> you know? So it's like, <laughs> right? I just I just went with it. I was like, man, I I could try and make my own. I wish I could have made my own, but I couldn't. I don't. I couldn't do. I couldn't beat that. So that's one of those. Right. I was like, dang, you'd just be it. chasing but, that, and it and it already yeah, exists. So I would might yeah, as exactly, well. exactly. Um, what is it that you like I, about that thing? I've seen that around, but I don't. I don't really know that much about it. Uh, so. I, I I don't use it for its full capabilities, but just the simple the simple man in me, I I'm very particular actually about like tap tempo based stuff, and I really okay. like them to be synced up. So if like a tap tempo capable pedal doesn't have an external tap jack, it's useless to me <laughs> for the most part. So like I like stuff because. Any anything I'm typically playing with, we're playing to it with a metronome, and I just like it to be locked in. So just having everything locked in to the tempo is amazing. But the other side of things that is a very minor thing, but I actually really enjoy, is that you can name all of your your tempo settings. You can name it like with the song name. So it's also like if you're, you know, because I I play a lot at church and stuff and. It's actually really nice because your set list is there. You can like visually see your set list. You don't have to write it down on a napkin or like on a piece of paper or something. It's like literally you can program it into the pedal and see, oh, that's the song that's next. Like actually oh, have the name yeah. listed. <laughs> that's that's you know? actually really, that's really handy. I <laughs> yeah. And we'll even just I like, think... that's the preset for this song it, instead of trying to go, one, preset one two dash a is for you know i hate exactly. my exactly or whatever song yeah. it is. that's probably not that's probably not what they play at church but <laughs> <laughs> no not necessarily but that's i think I that, trying to that think of some of random the, song that was one of the kind of things that i think won the courts over the disaster area version for me i I could be wrong. At least when I was looking at it, I don't. I think the disaster area one was just like number based, like you said. And I, I so. really liked. I really liked the fact that on the courts you could literally name it the song name and be like, "Oh, that's what that is." It's very, very simple in that way. Uh, so yeah, that's jealous over those because um, that's kind of stuff that's right in my wheelhouse that if I would have just uh, got into earlier I could have probably put something out like that but it's not worth it it's not worth my time now not anymore yeah I understand nah. that for sure you know you you mentioned something that that that's really interesting and it it reflects like or not reflects that's a bad word to use but like it shows how vast the difference between players can be is I I have used tap tempo and I totally understand its appeal in certain situations, but the way I play and the, the bands that I have played with tap tempos never really made any sense for those bands. Uh, like I, I use like delay. I don't sync it up with the rest of the band. I'm using it as an effect to get the tone that I'm shooting for, you know, uh, uh, maybe yep. a little, maybe a little more Gilmore and a little less edge, you know, type of situation mm-hmm. where, uh, where this tap has never, except for certain things in certain situations, it's never really been necessary for me at all. But some people, it's entirely, it's in like it's like the basis of their sound almost. I I interviewed a, a guy Alex from a band called Glass Lungs, and they he described them as like a gear based band to where he's like if we don't if our time based effects don't have a tap in, just like you said, it's literally useless. Because they have like four guitar players all playing to the same click, like all synced up, all doing crazy, weird, different things that require like super tight, super close together and locked in sounds. And it's just weird. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I have n- I have almost no need for that <laughs> at all. 
<laughs> which is which is just uh, weird to see some people with similar interests and totally different approaches to things. Yeah, for sure. And I'm I'm too much of a perfectionist, and that's for sure a fault. Because um, sometimes I'll like if I'm playing something and the the delay trails and the repeats aren't falling in the right place mm -hmm. with what I'm playing, then I it drives me insane. <laughs> so it's like if you're using it, I understand if you're using it to like give you a different tone and maybe it's not as prominent in the mix. It's more of kind of an undercurrent uh, that's not as noticeable, but when it's more of a, for a rhythmic effect and like, it's supposed to be an eight, it's supposed to be a dotted eighth and it's accidentally set to eighth note. And if you're playing in a, you know, a three, four, I don't know, three, four time signature or something, things just fall in the wrong place. You know, the delay is just repeating and it's just hitting it in the wrong spots. And sometimes they can make it sound dissonant and weird. And so having things synced up and, and, and really falling where they should is, it just makes me happy inside. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's what it's really all about at the end of the day. It's making people happy yep. inside. Yeah. All of right. Course. Well, we're winding down to the last little bit here and I got a few more questions for you. A few more of the classic questions. I kind of like to call these, these last few, but one of them oh, yeah. is, is a, is a good one. And I, I feel like I wish I would have integrated this a long time ago into the show, but I didn't. What is your favorite boss pedal? Oh, boss pedal. Uh, I had, man, that's hard to pick. I haven't, I, I'll, I'll be honest and say I haven't tried an absolute ton of them, but I did when I first started playing guitar, I got like five of them all at once. That was like, you know, I had a pedal board of like five boss pedals. It was great. Nice. Um, so I think it, so I had a DD three for a really long time. I actually, I might pick this one. This one is kind of off the wall. I had a chorus ensemble. I think it was CE five. I think that's the na the number on it, but I had a chorus ensemble that I had for way longer than I expected. And I actually use that like always on which is weird, but I had that pedal always on at like a lighter setting and it seemed to give a unique fullness and movement to the sound that was like, it was one of those that was like, it wasn't noticeable, but if like you turned it off, you're like, wow, I meant I lost something. And you know, that's a very unpopular one. So I'm just, I'm, I'm going to try and stay, stay out of cliche and, and say, I'll go with that one. I like just it. Just I did not expect it. And then One I realized oh, look, sorry. I realized look I realized looking back that I use that a whole lot actually. That that is one I have not heard. And one thing I've I've found with that question is I, I keep expecting, you know, there to be some sort of common answer. And everyone has a wildly different opinion. You know, I've got people saying the LS2 is their favorite, which some that that's like, whoa, I didn't okay. Didn't see that one coming. This one definitely mm. didn't see coming. I'm not getting the classics like I would expect. I would expect everyone to be like, oh, the OD one or the, you know, the DM2 or something that's just widely regarded as good. Uh, but no, I'm getting some pretty unique answers. I like it. It's really, mm -hmm. really cool. Now, I did have I had a blues blues driver, super overdrive, DD3. Those were all in conjunction with that chorus that I got at the same time. So I had some classics or uh, classics for, for that time when I was buying them, I guess. I like the blues driver. I got to say some people don't like the blues driver. I, I like the blues driver. It's a nice sound in overdrive to me. It, it served me well for a long time. <laughs> you still Is it one of those things where you still have it somewhere? It's just like locked in a closet somewhere. <laughs> No, unfortunately, there are some things that I wish I didn't do this, but for the most part, if it's not on my current active board, I've kind of sold everything that I don't actively use. 
I kind of started doing that a long time ago when I was like trying to fund building pedals, <laughs> you know? Yes. Yeah. So uh-huh. I was like, I got stuff on the shelf and yeah, I would love to hang on to this, but I also really want to buy some parts to try and learn how to do such and such. So I've kind of unfortunately con- continued that trend and my shelves, my shelves are kind of empty on just stuff sitting around. <laughs> so, so you're the opposite of me. Is what you just told <laughs> yes, me. yeah. I I actually I absolutely am. I've seen your cabinet. I'm the hoarder. It's it's gotten worse. <laughs> I had my my friend's dad came over a little while ago, and he was like, "Wow, you really have gotten into this pedal thing, haven't you?" And I was like, "Yeah, turn around and <laughs> and open those drawers over there." Like, because he already he was, he was like look, looking looking at the cabinet, you know. And then he, but he was standing like he didn't know right behind him was an entire cabinet full as in well. the drawers. Yeah. Yeah, you have uh, really like, gotten into this pedal thing. <laughs> yeah, it's like I sure, I sure have, I sure have. That's great. Well, Drew, this has been, yeah, the, this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, of course. Oh, sorry, it. you sound like you were trying to finish a thought there. I cut you off. No, I was just going to say real quick. The only things sitting on my shelves are like half working, broken prototypes. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what my shelves are full of. For what you do, yeah, that's man. probably the that's probably the best thing that your shelves could be full of. So please keep it up. Yeah, I will. And yeah, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. I feel like it's been kind of a long time coming. We've we've chatted here and there off and on, but never got together. So yeah, it. we need this was way overdue, way overdue. But yeah, so we're closing in on the last last little bit here, and we got to go to the big one. What's your favorite kind of? Pizza? Oh yeah. <laughs> uh it's been a long time since i listened but i knew that was coming um uh, let's see so i'll have to say going back to college and getting dominoes with our dining dollars because they took dining dollars it was great i would get uh their buffalo chicken just like chicken and hot sauce mm-hmm. and i love that and I have to get that. My wife hates it. She she doesn't like really either of those things uh, on pizza. So whenever she's she's gone or I'm on my own, fend it for myself. That's uh, I try to I try to get that whenever I can. Buffalo chicken pizza. Love Buffalo it. chicken from Domino's. That there again did uh, not see that one. Not coming. necessarily from Domino's anymore. It's more of a harken back to the old college days. But gotcha. Something uh. We've got we've got a couple of nice nice pizza places here in Birmingham, and you can get something similar. Just kind of a, just kind of a buffalo chicken. Yeah, I feel you. I feel you. Love it. So I, this is probably going to expose my my massive redneck ignorance to lots of people. But dining dollars. What are dining dollars, and how do I get? Oh, uh, di- dining dollars are just the. It was like the uh, the on campus meal plan at Alabama. Is, okay. uh, is what it was. So, but f- there were a couple of places around Tuscaloosa in the college town that took dining dollars outside of like the college uh, cafeterias, and Domino's was one. So, there was a lot Domino's of Domino's delivery. Coming. Yeah, there was a lot of Domino's delivery to our uh, our house where I lived with a bunch of, a bunch of college friends. So. That Domino's, uh, that particular franchise is a very intelligent owner. Apparently, he's like, "We're gonna park this close to a college and take their special currency." And yeah, like, yep. Of, of course, that Domino's is gonna slay a Domino's with basically, you know, cheap Domino's by a college campus. So, come on, that's genius. Yep, take the college kids' prepaid money that they've loaded on a card and just spend willy nilly. Yeah. Just go to just go to town. Extra go to cheap. town. Yep. Go to town. Yep. All right, Drew. Where can everybody where can everybody find you on the internet? Uh so we got a website. Obviously, that's where our store is, swindlerfx.com. We're on most social media. Instagram is where we're the most active. Facebook. Uh I reply to comments and stuff, but Facebook is pretty much just reposts from our stuff on Instagram. <laughs> so but yeah. Twitter, nah. Nah, honestly, no. But I like pictures better. I I agree with you. All right, man. 
<laughs> well, thanks so much for coming on. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this thing up. So for Drew, this is Blake. And as always, folks, good luck and good tones. What a treat that was. Thank you for hanging out with us. You know, being here and just being you. You're great. You're a wonderful person. And I don't care what yeah, other person said about you. I think you're awesome because you listen to this podcast and therefore you must be. There's no other there's no other way that you could be. It's just how it is. But no, seriously, thanks for checking it out and thanks for all of the iTunes reviews that have been coming in lately. That has been very 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 helpful. Thank you. Thank you all so much for that. And again, you know, if you need me for anything, hit me up at info at tonemob.com or on the socials. Uh sometimes the email has a little bit of a issue cuz it's a dumb website thing but uh hit me up wherever whenever for whatever and i will try to help as best i can um yeah thanks for thanks for sitting here thanks for listening to all this there are a lot of things you could be listening to and you listen clear to the very end of the tone mob podcast and for that i am, am eternally grateful so thank you all so much i'll talk to you next week unless you're a patreon subscriber in which case you're probably going to click right over and listen to the rest of this conversation because that's where it is you go to patreon.com slash tone mob. You can check out different levels that help support the show and get you extra things, extra podcast episodes, extra content, extra stuff for your ears. It's all over there. So go ahead and check it out. Let me know what you think. And peace, love, and good fuzz. One last thing before we totally sign off here. I just want to remind you that if you do any shopping at Stringjoy, that's Stringjoy Guitar Strings made in Nashville, that will help me out as well. As I've said for years, I'm heavily involved in that company, and I really do think they're making the best products on the market. So if you would like to try custom strings, go to ToneMob.com Stringjoy and check them out today. I seriously, seriously, seriously love what the team down there is doing. I help them out with all kinds of things, and by you supporting them, you are also supporting me as well. And hey, you need some strings, so why not get some custom strings just for your guitar and playing style? Again, the link for that is tonemob.com slash stringjoy, and that will take you right to their website, and you can do all your shopping through there, and that will help everyone involved out. So thank you very much. Talk to you next time. We are brought to you by the wonderful folks at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Yes, Gun Street Wiring Shop. I've talked about them before. I used to say based out of Bend, Oregon, but guess what? Sean moved to my neck of the woods. Sean's in Portland. Sean is awesome and has helped me with a bunch of stuff lately. And if you have wiring needs for your guitar, he can help you too. If you want to get weird with it, he can get weird. If you just need to spruce things up a little bit, there's your guy. He takes all the guesswork out of doing your guitar wiring, and he makes it simple and his customer service is top-notch, and I can't say enough good things about Gun Street as a company. I really respect Sean and what he's all about, and the product is top-notch. I've got three different guitars that now have Gun Street harnesses in them, and I could not be happier. So go to GunStreetWiringShop.com and check them out.